Part One of the Old English Baron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old English Baron, a Gothic story by Clara Reeve, Part One. In the minority of Henry the Sixth, King of England, when the renowned John, Duke of Bedford, was Regent of France, and Humphrey, the good Duke of Gloucester, was Protector of England. A worthy knight, called Sir Philip Harclay, returned from his travels to England, his native country. He had served under the glorious King Henry V with distinguished valour, and had acquired an honourable fame, and was no less esteemed for Christian virtues than for deeds of chivalry. After the death of his prince, he entered into the service of the Greek Emperor, and distinguished his courage against the encroachment of the Saracens. In battle there he took prisoner a certain gentleman, by name Monsieur Zadisky, of Greek extraction, but brought up by a Saracen officer. This man he converted to the Christian faith, after which he bound him to himself by the ties of friendship and gratitude, and he resolved to continue with his benefactor. After thirty years' travel and warlike service, he determined to return to his native land, and to spend the remainder of his life in peace and, by devoting himself to works of piety and charity, prepare for a better state hereafter. This noble knight had, in his early youth, contracted a strict friendship with the only son of the Lord Lovell, a gentleman of eminent virtues and accomplishments. During Sir Philip's residence in foreign countries, he had frequently written to his friend, and had for a time received answers. The last informed him of the death of old Lord Lovell, and the marriage of the young one, but from that time he had heard no more from him. Sir Philip imputed it not to neglect or forgetfulness, but to the difficulties of intercourse, common at that time to all travellers and adventurers. When he was returning home, he resolved, after looking into his family affairs, to visit the castle of Lovell, and inquire into the situation of his friend. He landed in Kent, attended by his Greek friend and two faithful servants, one of which was maimed by the wounds he had received in the defence of his master. Sir Philip went to his family seat in Yorkshire. He found his mother and sister were dead, and his estates sequestered in the hands of commissioners appointed by the protector. He was obliged to prove the reality of his claim, and the identity of his person, by the testimony of some of the old servants of his family, after which everything was restored to him. He took possession of his own house, established his household, settled the old servants in their former stations, and placed those he brought home in the upper offices of his family. He then left his friend to superintend his domestic affairs, and, attended by only one of his old servants, he set out for the castle of Lovell, in the west of England. They travelled by easy journeys, but, toward the evening of the second day, the servant was so ill and fatigued he could go no further. He stopped at an inn, where he grew worse every hour, and the next day expired. Sir Philip was under great concern for the loss of his servant, and some for himself, being alone in a strange place. However, he took courage, ordered his servant's funeral, attended it himself, and, having shed a tear of humanity over his grave, proceeded alone on his journey. As he drew near the estate of his friend, he began to inquire of every one he met whether the Lord Lovell resided at the seat of his ancestors. He was answered by one, he did not know, by another, he could not tell, by a third, that he never heard of such a person. Sir Philip thought it strange that a man of Lord Lovell's consequence should be unknown in his own neighbourhood, and where his ancestors had usually resided. He ruminated on the uncertainty of human happiness. This world, said he, has nothing for a wise man to depend on. I have lost all my relations, and most of my friends, and am even uncertain whether any are remaining. I will, however, be thankful for the blessings that are spared to me, and I will endeavour to replace those that I have lost. If my friend lives, he shall share my fortune with me, his children shall have the reversion of it, and I will share his comforts in return. But perhaps my friend may have met with troubles that have made him disgusted with the world. Perhaps he has buried his amiable wife or his promising children, and, tired of public life, he has retired into a monastery. At least I will know what all this silence means. When he came within a mile of the castle of Lovell, 
he stopped at a cottage and asked for a draught of water. A peasant, master of the house, brought it, and asked if his honour would alight and take a moment's refreshment. Sir Philip accepted his offer, being resolved to make farther inquiry before he approached the castle. He asked the same questions of him that he had before of others. "'Which, Lord Lovell,' said the man, "'does your honour inquire after?' "'The man whom I knew was called Arthur,' said Sir Philip. "'I,' said the peasant, "'he was the only surviving son of Richard, Lord Lovell, as I think.' "'Very true, friend, he was so.' "'Alas, sir,' said the man, "'he is dead. He survived his father but a short time.' "'Dead, say you? How long since?' "'About fifteen years, to the best of my remembrance.' Sir Philip sighed deeply. Alas, said he, what we do by living long but survive all our friends. But pray, tell me how he died. I will, sir, to the best of my knowledge. And please your honour, I heard say, that he attended the king when he went against the Welch rebels, and he left his lady big with child. And so there was a battle fought, and the king got the better of the rebels. There came first a report that none of the officers were killed, but a few days after there came a messenger with an account very different, that several were wounded, and that the Lord Lovell was slain, which sad news overset us all with sorrow, for he was a noble gentleman, a bountiful master, and the delight of all the neighbourhood. He was indeed, said Sir Philip, all that is amiable and good. He was my dear and noble friend, and I am inconsolable for his loss. But the unfortunate lady, what became of her? Why, and please your honour, they said she died of grief for the loss of her husband, but her death was kept private for a time, and we did not know it for certain till some weeks afterwards. The will of heaven be obeyed, said Sir Philip, but who succeeded to the title and estate? The next heir, said the peasant, a kinsman of the deceased, Sir Walter Lovell by name. I have seen him, said Sir Philip, formerly, but where was he when these events happened? At the castle of Lovell, sir, he came there on a visit to the lady, and waited there to receive my lord at his return from Wales, and when the news of his death arrived, Sir Walter did everything in his power to comfort her, and some said he was to marry her, but she refused to be comforted, and took it so to heart that she died. And does the present Lord Lovell reside at the castle? No, sir. Who, then? The Lord Baron Fitzowen. And how came Sir Walter to leave the seat of his ancestors? Why, sir, he married his sister to this said lord, and so he sold the castle to him, and went away, and built himself a house in the north country, as far as Northumberland, I think they call it. That is very strange, said Sir Philip. So it is, please your honour, but this is all I know about it. I thank you, friend, for your intelligence. I have taken a long journey to no purpose, and have met with nothing but cross accidents, this life is, indeed, a pilgrimage. Pray direct me to the nearest way to the next monastery. Noble sir, said the peasant, it is full five miles off, the night is coming on, and the ways are bad. I am but a poor man, and cannot entertain your honour as you are used to. But if you will enter my poor cottage, that and everything in it are at your service. My honest friend, I thank you heartily, said Sir Philip. Your kindness and hospitality might shame many of higher birth and breeding. I will accept your kind offer, but pray let me know the name of my host. John Wyatt, sir, an honest man, though a poor one, and a Christian man, though a sinful one. Whose cottage is this? It belongs to the Lord Fitzowen. What family have you? A wife, two sons, and a daughter, who will all be proud to wait upon your honour. Let me hold your honour's stirrup whilst you alight. He seconded these words by the proper action, and having assisted his guest to dismount, he conducted him into his house, called his wife to attend him, and then led his horse under a poor shed that served him as a stable. Sir Philip was fatigued in body and mind, and was glad to repose himself anywhere. The courtesy of his host engaged his attention, and satisfied his wishes. He soon after returned, followed by a youth of about eighteen years. "'Make haste, John,' said the father and be sure that you say neither more nor less than what I have told you. I will, father, said the lad, and immediately set off, ran like a buck across the field, and was out of sight in an instant. I hope, friend, said Sir Philip, you have not sent your son to provide for my entertainment. I am a soldier, used to lodge and fare hard, and, 
If it were otherwise, your courtesy and kindness would give a relish to the most ordinary food. I wish heartily, said Wyatt, it was in my power to entertain your honour as you ought to be, but, as I cannot do so, I will, when my son returns, acquaint you with the errand I sent him on. After this they conversed together on common subjects, like fellow creatures of the same natural form and endowments, though different kinds of education had given a conscious superiority to the one, a conscious inferiority to the other, and the due respect was paid by the latter without being exacted by the former. In about half an hour young John returned. "'Thou hast made haste,' said the father. "'Not more than good speed,' quoth the son. "'Tell us, then, how you speed.' "'Shall I tell all that passed?' said John. "'All,' said the father. "'I don't want to hide anything.' John stood with his cap in his hand, and thus told his tale. "'I went straight to the castle as fast as I could run. "'It was my hap to light on young Master Edmund first. "'So I told him just as you had me, "'that a noble gentleman was come a long journey from foreign parts "'to see the Lord Lovell, his friend, "'and, having lived abroad many years, "'he did not know that he was dead.' and that the castle was fallen into other hands, that upon hearing these tidings he was much grieved and disappointed, and wanting a night's lodging, to rest himself before he returned to his own home, he was fain to take up with one at our cottage, that my father thought my lord would be angry with him if he were not told of the stranger's journey and intentions, especially to let such a man lie at our cottage, where he could neither be lodged nor entertained according to his quality. Here John stopped, and his father exclaimed, a good lad, you did your errand very well, and tell us the answer. John proceeded. Master Edmund ordered me some beer, and went to acquaint my lord of the message. He stayed a while, and then came back to me. John, said he, tell the noble stranger that the Baron Fitzowen greets him well, and desires him to rest assured that though Lord Lovell is dead, and the castle fallen into other hands, his friends will always find a welcome there, and my lord desires that he will accept of a lodging there, while he remains in this country. So I came away directly, and made haste to deliver my errand. Sir Philip expressed some dissatisfaction at the mark of old Wyatt's respect. I wish, said he, that you had acquainted me with your intention before you sent to inform the baron I was here. I choose rather to lodge with you, and I propose to make amends for the trouble I shall give you. Pray, sir, don't mention it, said the peasant. You are as welcome as myself. I hope no offence. The only reason of my sending was, because I am both unable and unworthy to entertain your honour. I am sorry, said Sir Philip, you should think me so dainty. I am a Christian soldier, and him I acknowledge for my prince and master accepted the invitations of the poor and washed the feet of his disciples. Let us say no more on this head. I am resolved to stay this night in your cottage. To-morrow I will wait on the baron and thank him for his hospitable invitation." That shall be as your honour pleases, since you will condescend to stay here. John, do you run back and acquaint my lord of it? Not so, said Sir Philip. It is now almost dark. Tis no matter, said John. I can go blindfold. Sir Philip then gave him a message to the baron in his own name, acquainting him that he would pay his respects to him in the morning. John flew back the second time, and soon returned with new commendations from the baron, and that he would expect him on the morrow. Sir Philip gave him an angel of gold, and praised his speed and abilities. He supped with Wyatt and his family, upon new-laid eggs and rashers of bacon, with the highest relish. They praised the Creator for his gifts, and acknowledged they were unworthy of the least of his blessings. They gave the best of their two lofts up to Sir Philip. The rest of the family slept in the other, the old woman and her daughter in the bed, the father and his two sons upon clean straw. Sir Philip's bed was of a better kind, and yet much inferior to his usual accommodations. Nevertheless, the good knight slept as well in Wyatt's cottage as he could have done in a palace. During his sleep many strange and incoherent dreams arose to his imagination. He thought he received a message from his friend Lord Lovell to come to him at the castle, that he stood at the gate and received him, that he strove to embrace him but could not, but that he spoke to this effect. Though I have been dead these fifteen years, I still command here, and none can enter these gates without my permission. I know it is I that invite, and bid you welcome. The hopes of my house rest upon you. 
Upon this he bid Sir Philip follow him, and he led him through many rooms, till at last he sunk down, and Sir Philip thought that he still followed him, till he came to a dark and frightful cave, where he disappeared, and in his stead he beheld a complete suit of armor stained with blood, which belonged to his friend, and he thought he heard dismal groans from beneath. Presently after he thought he was hurried away by an invisible hand, and led into a wild heath, where the people were enclosing the ground, and making preparations for two combatants. The trumpet sounded, and a voice called out still louder, Forbear, it is not permitted to be revealed till the time is ripe for the event. Wait with patience on the decrees of heaven. He was then transported to his own house, where, going into an unfrequented room, he was again met by his friend, who was living and in all the bloom of youth, as when he first knew him. He started at the sight, and awoke. The sun shone upon his curtains, and, perceiving it was day, he sat up and recollected where he was. The images that impressed his sleeping fancy remained strongly on his mind waking. But his reason strove to disperse them. It was natural that the story he had heard should create these ideas, that they should wait on him in his sleep and that every dream should bear some relation to his deceased friend. The sun dazzled his eyes, the birds serenaded him and diverted his attention, and a woodbine forced its way through the window, and regaled his sense of smelling with its fragrance. He arose, paid his devotions to heaven, and then carefully descended the narrow stairs, and went out at the door of the cottage. There he saw the industrious wife and daughter of old Wyatt at their morning work, the one milking her cow, the other feeding her poultry. He asked for a draught of milk, which, with a slice of rye bread, served to break his fast. He walked about the fields alone, for old Wyatt and his two sons were gone out to their daily labor. He was called back by the good woman, who told him that a servant from the baron waited to conduct him to the castle. He took leave of Wyatt's wife, telling her he would see her again before he left the country. The daughter fetched his horse, which he mounted, and set forward with the servant, of whom he asked many questions concerning his master's family. "'How long have you lived with the baron?' Ten years. "'Is he a good master?' "'Yes, sir, and also a good husband and father.' "'What family has he?' Three sons and a daughter.' "'What age are they of?' "'The eldest son is in his seventeenth year, the second in his sixteenth, the other several years younger.' But besides these, my lord has several young gentlemen brought up with his own sons, two of which are his nephews. He keeps in his house a learned clerk to teach them languages, and as for all bodily exercises, none come near them. There is a fletcher to teach them the use of the crossbow, a master to teach them to ride, another the use of the sword, another learns them to dance, and then they wrestle and run, and have such activity in all their motions that it does one good to see them and my lord thinks nothing too much to bestow on their education. Truly, says Sir Philip, he does the part of a good parent, and I honor him greatly for it. But are the young gentlemen of a promising disposition? Yes, indeed, sir, answered the servant. The young gentlemen, my lord's sons, are hopeful youths, but yet there is one who is thought to exceed them all, though he is the son of a poor laborer. And who is he? said the knight. One Edmund Twyford, the son of a cottager in our village. He is to be sure as fine a youth as ever the sun shone upon, and of so sweet a disposition that nobody envies his good fortune. What good fortune does he enjoy? Why, sir, about two years ago my lord, at his son's request, took him into his own family and gives him the same education as his own children. The young lords dote upon him, especially Master William, who is about his own age. It is supposed that he will attend the young lords when they go to the wars, which my lord intends they shall by and by. What you tell me, said Sir Philip, increases every minute my respect for your lord. He is an excellent father and master. He seeks out merit in obscurity. He distinguishes and rewards it. I honor him with all my heart. In this manner they conversed together till they came within view of the castle. In a field near the house they saw a company of youths with crossbows in their hands, shooting at a mark. There, said the servant, are our young gentlemen at their exercises. Sir Philip stopped his horse and observed them. He heard two or three of them cry out, Edmund is the victor, he wins the prize. I must, said Sir Philip, take a view of this Edmund. 
He jumped off his horse, gave the bridle to the servant, and walked into the field. The young gentlemen came up and paid their respects to him. He apologized for intruding upon their sports and asked which was the victor. Upon which the youth he spoke to beckoned to another, who immediately advanced, and made his obscience. As he drew near, Sir Philip fixed his eyes upon him, with so much attention that he seemed not to observe his courtesy and address. At length he recollected himself, and said, "'What is your name, young man?' "'Edmund Twyford,' replied the youth, "'and I have the honour to attend upon the Lord Fitzowen's sons.' "'Pray, noble sir,' said the youth who first addressed Sir Philip, "'are not you the stranger who is expected by my father?' "'I am, sir,' answered he, "'and I go to pay my respects to him.' "'Will you excuse our attendance, sir? "'We have not yet finished our exercises.' "'My dear youth,' said Sir Philip, "'no apology is necessary. "'But will you favour me with your proper name, "'that I may know to whose courtesy I am obliged?' "'My name is William Fitzowen. "'That gentleman is my eldest brother, Master Robert. "'That other my kinsman, Master Richard Wenlock. "'Very well. "'I thank you, gentle sir. "'I beg you not to stir another step. "'Your servant holds my horse.' "'Farewell, sir,' said Master William. "'I hope we shall have the pleasure of meeting you at dinner.' The youths returned to their sports, and Sir Philip mounted his horse and proceeded to the castle. He entered it with a deep sigh and melancholy recollections. The baron received him with the utmost respect and courtesy. He gave a brief account of the principal events that had happened in the family of Lovell during his absence. He spoke of the late Lord Lovell with respect, of the present with the affection of a brother. Sir Philip, in return, gave a brief recital of his own adventures abroad and of the disagreeable circumstances he had met with since his return home. He pathetically lamented the loss of all his friends, not forgetting that of his faithful servant on the way, saying he could be contented to give up the world and retire to a religious house, but that he was withheld by the consideration, that some who depended entirely upon him would want his presence and assistance, and, beside that, he thought he might be of service to many others. The baron agreed with him in opinion, that a man was of much more service to the world who continued in it, than one who retired from it and gave his fortune to the church, whose servants did not always make the best use of it. Sir Philip then turned the conversation, and congratulated the baron on his hopeful family. He praised their persons and address, and warmly applauded the care he bestowed on their education. The baron listened with pleasure to the honest approbation of a worthy heart, and enjoyed the true happiness of a parent. Sir Philip then made further inquiry concerning Edmund, whose appearance had struck him with an impression in his favour. "'That boy,' said the baron, "'is the son of a cottager in this neighbourhood. His uncommon merit and gentleness of manners distinguish him from those of his own class. From his childhood he attracted the notice and affection of all that knew him. He was beloved everywhere but at his father's house, and there it should seem that his merits were his crimes, for the peasant, his father, hated him.' treated him severely, and at length threatened to turn him out of doors. He used to run here and there on errands for my people, and at length they obliged me to take notice of him. My sons earnestly desired I would take him into my family. I did so about two years ago, intending to make him their servant. But his extraordinary genius and disposition have obliged me to look upon him in a superior light. Perhaps I may incur the censure of many people." by giving him so many advantages, and treating him as the companion of my children, his merit must justify or condemn my partiality for him. However, I trust that I have secured to my children a faithful servant of the upper kind, and a useful friend to the family. Sir Philip warmly applauded his generous host, and wished to be a sharer in his bounty to that fine youth, whose appearance indicated all the qualities that had endeared him to his companions. At the hour of dinner the young men presented themselves before their lord and his guest. Sir Philip addressed himself to Edmund. He asked him many questions and received modest and intelligent answers, and he grew every minute more pleased with him. After dinner the youths withdrew with their tutor to pursue their studies. Sir Philip sat for some time wrapped in meditation. After some minutes the baron asked him if he might not be favoured with the fruits of his contemplations. "'You shall, my lord,' answered he for you have a right to them. I was thinking that when many blessings are lost we should cherish those that remain, and even endeavour to replace the others. My lord, 
I have taken a strong liking to that youth whom you call Edmund Twyford. I have neither children nor relations to claim my fortune, nor share my affections. Your lordship has many demands upon your generosity. I can provide for this promising youth without doing injustice to any one. Will you give him to me? He is a fortunate boy, said the baron, to gain your favor so soon. My lord, said the knight, I will confess to you that the first thing that touched my heart in his favor is a strong resemblance that he bears to a certain dear friend I once had, and his manner resembles him as much as his person. His qualities deserve that he should be placed in a higher rank. I will adopt him for my son, and introduce him to the world as my relation, if you will resign him to me. What say you? Sir, said the baron, you have made a noble offer, and I am too much the young man's friend to be a hindrance to his preferment. It is true that I intended to provide for him in my own family, but I cannot do it so effectually as by giving him to you, whose generous affection being unlimited by other ties, may in time prefer him to a higher station as he shall deserve it. I have only one condition to make, that the lad shall have his option, for I would not oblige him to leave my service against his inclination. You say well, replied Sir Philip, nor would I take him upon other terms. Agreed, then, said the baron, let us send for Edmund hither. A servant was sent to fetch him. He came immediately, and his lord thus bespoke him. Edmund, you owe eternal obligations to this gentleman, who, perceiving in you a certain resemblance to a friend of his, and liking your behavior, has taken a great affection for you, insomuch that he desires to receive you into his family. I cannot better provide for you than by disposing of you to him, and, if you have no objection, you shall return home with him when he goes from hence." The countenance of Edmund underwent many alterations during this proposal of his lord. It expressed tenderness, gratitude, and sorrow, but the last was predominant. He bowed respectfully to the baron and Sir Philip, and, after some hesitation, spoke as follows. I feel very strongly the obligations I owe to this gentleman for his noble and generous offer. I cannot express the sense I have of his goodness to me, a peasant boy, only known to him by my lord's kind and partial mention. This uncommon bounty claims my eternal gratitude. To you, my honored lord, I owe everything, even this gentleman's good opinion. You distinguished me when no one else did, and, next to you, your sons are my best and dearest benefactors. They introduced me to your notice. My heart is unalterably attached to this house and family, and my utmost ambition is to spend my life in your service. But if you have perceived any great and grievous faults in me, that make you wish to put me out of your family, and if you have recommended me to this gentleman in order to be rid of me, in that case I will submit to your pleasure, as I would if you should sentence me to death. During this speech the tears made themselves channels down Edmund's cheeks, and his two noble auditors, catching the tender inflection, wiped their eyes at the conclusion. My dear child, said the baron, you overcome me by your tenderness and gratitude. I know of no faults you have committed that I should wish to be rid of you. I thought to do you the best service by promoting you to that of Sir Philip Harclay, who is both able and willing to provide for you. But if you prefer my service to him, I will not part with you. Upon this Edmund kneeled to the baron. He embraced his knees. My dear lord, I am and will be your servant in preference to any man living. I only ask your permission to live and die in your service. You see, Sir Philip, said the baron, how this boy engages the heart. How can I part with him? I cannot ask you any more, answered Sir Philip. I see it is impossible, but I esteem you both still higher than ever, the youth for his gratitude, and your lordship for your noble mind and true generosity. Blessings attend you both. Oh, sir, said Edmund, pressing the hand of Sir Philip, do not think me ungrateful to you. I will ever remember your goodness and pray to heaven to reward it. The name of Sir Philip Harclay shall be engraven upon my heart, next to my lord and his family, for ever. Sir Philip raised the youth and embraced him, saying, If ever you want a friend, remember me, and depend upon my protection so long as you continue to deserve it. Edmund bowed low and withdrew, with his eyes full of tears of sensibility and gratitude. When he was gone, Sir Philip said, I am thinking, 
that though young Edmund wants not my assistance at present, he may hereafter stand in need of my friendship. I shall not wonder if such rare qualities as he possesses should one day create envy and raise his enemies, in which case he might come to lose your favor without any fault of yours or his own. I am obliged to you for the warning, said the baron. I hope it will be unnecessary, but if ever I part with Edmund, you shall have the refusal of him. I thank your lordship for all your civilities to me, said the knight. I leave my best wishes with you and your hopeful family, and I humbly take my leave. Will you not stay one night in the castle, returned my lord? You shall be as welcome a guest as ever. I acknowledge your goodness and hospitality, but this house fills me with melancholy recollections. I came hither with heavy heart, and it will not be lighter while I remain here. I shall always remember your lordship with the highest respect and esteem, and I pray God to preserve you and increase your blessings. After some further ceremonies, Sir Philip departed and returned to old Wyatt's, ruminating on the vicissitudes of human affairs, and thinking on the changes he had seen. At his return to Wyatt's cottage he found the family assembled together. He told them he would take another night's lodging there, which they heard with great pleasure, for he had familiarized himself to them in the last evening's conversation, insomuch that they began to enjoy his company. He told Wyatt of the misfortune he had sustained by losing his servant on the way, and wished he could get one to attend him home in his place. Young John looked earnestly at his father, who returned a look of approbation. "'I perceive one in this company,' he said, "'that would be proud to serve your honour, but I fear he is not brought up well enough.' John coloured with impatience. He could not forbear speaking. "'Sir, I can answer for an honest heart, a willing mind, and a light pair of heels, and though I am somewhat awkward, I shall be proud to learn, to please my noble master, if he will but try me.' "'You say well,' said Sir Philip. "'I have observed your qualifications, and if you are desirous to serve me, I am equally pleased with you. If your father has no objection, I will take you.' "'Objection, sir,' said the old man. "'It will be my pride to prefer him to such a noble gentleman. I will make no terms for him, but leave it to your honour to do for him as he shall deserve.' "'Very well,' said Sir Philip. "'You shall be no loser by that. I will charge myself with the care of the young man.' The bargain was struck, and Sir Philip purchased a horse for John of the old man. The next morning they set out. The knight left marks of his bounty with the good couple, and departed, laden with their blessings and prayers. He stopped at the place where his faithful servant was buried, and caused masses to be said for the repose of his soul. Then, pursuing his way by easy journeys, arrived in safety at home. His family rejoiced at his return. He settled his new servant in attendance upon his person. He then looked round his neighbourhood for objects of his charity. When he saw merit in distress, it was his delight to raise and support it. He spent his time in the service of his Creator, and glorified him in doing good to his creatures. He reflected frequently upon everything that had befallen him in his late journey to the West, and, at his leisure, took down all the particulars in writing. Here follows an interval of four years, as by the manuscript, and this omission seems intended by the writer. What follows is in a different hand, and the character is more modern. End of Part 1 Read by Marianne Spiegel